And interestingly, we found a, a pattern. Probably we'll need more, more studies to confirm this, but we found a pattern. The first pattern is that the PCB4 replicating the germinal centers, exactly the same thing that PCB2 does. When you look at PCB3, the, the, the virus normally replicate on those inflammatory cells, the perivascular inflammation that we keep mentioning. So this is a totally different. It looks more like PCB2 than PCB3. That's the first thing. Okay, so now we have this lymph lesion, which clinically what it means, we don't know. Perhaps just a small or slight immune depression that exacerbates other things. That can happen. So what else? Where, where else can we find it? So we start labeling other, other tissues, and we found out that the virus replicate on the lamina propria of the intestine when the intestine has inflammation. Example, cases with um, lausonia, Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson, and I'm the host of the podcast. Joining me in our illustrious podcast studios for this week's recording is Dr. Pablo Pinheiro. Dr. Pinheiro is a associate professor and diagnostic pathologist at Iowa State University's Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. Dr. Pablo, thank you so much for coming on the, the show. I know you've been on before, but um, and certainly many people have worked with you and sent you tissues, uh, but just in case there's some folks out there that haven't interacted with you, why don't you start with a little introduction for the audience? Okay, great. Thank you, Clayton. Thank you for inviting me again. I mean, it's a pleasure being on the podcast with you again. Uh, we had a really nice chat last time. I hope we, we do the same today. So as you mentioned, I'm associate professor at Iowa State um, uh, Diagnostic Lab. Uh, mostly before I joined the lab, I did a PhD in molecular biology related with PERS and PCV2 back in Virginia and did my pathology training there. Um, Pathology residency. Um, before that, I was um, working in Argentina um, as a swine practitioner, kind of uh, mixing academia and practice. I was an independent swine practitioner and working in the academia, basically teaching pathology there. Uh, so that's kind of the, my, my journey to that led me here to Iowa State. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. Well, and at your time at Iowa State, you have developed some notoriety for your understanding of circovirus related disease. And uh, I've caveated that, or I've introduced it as circovirus related disease without, you know, saying specifically PCV2 or PCV3, or now even PCV4, because it's certainly an emerging topic of discussion. Um, Pablo, PCV4 is kind of where we want to start today. Um, you want to give us a, a bit of a broad overview of PCV4, right? How, how did we find it? How close is it to PCV3, PCV2? What what do you know about it, and what are we starting to understand with PCV4? So th this is a uh, really interesting. So PCV4 has been described probably 2019, so about five years ago. The first description was uh, in China. So and from there, there is a couple of reports in, in Asian countries, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, and so on. So we kind of been neglecting to study PCV4 here in the United States. And the same thing that what happened when we described PCV3. So interestingly, uh, one of my students, uh, now do Dr. Molly Kroger, she went to do uh, a scholarship in Thailand. And she said, I, I want to have a project. Uh, what can I do? So she developed this multiplex PCR, PCV2, PCV3, and PCV4. So she, she went to Thailand, did this project, and surprisingly, she found multiple co-infections. So she came back to Ames and said, you know what? I want to do the same thing here. No, please don't do it. Well, yep, she did it. And, and <laughs> surprisingly, uh, we basically ran, you know, we went to a fishing exploration. We started uh, grabbing samples with no specific clinical disease from the diagnostic lab. So she broke up this study doing 
100 lung, 100 feces, 100 spleen, 100 serum, 100 lymphoid tissues, including lymphonodes and tonsils, and 100 fetuses. Done. I said, okay, run your multiplex PCR. So at the time that we were doing this, uh, so I had information center learned that we were doing this kind of uh, uh, evaluation and they, they were really, really uh, helpful because they support, you know, there's a lot of testing involved here. So they su fully support this project. So we really uh, are thankful for that. Um, and so we, we run all these PCRs and there you go. PCV4 was in a lot of different sample types. So we found it in lung, we found it in feces, in feces spleen, serum, lymphoid tissue, but not in fetuses. I'm going to highlight that one. So a couple of reports here and there describe PCV4 as a cause of abortion. Well, it was detected in fetuses, but doesn't mean that cause abortion. So and here we got 100 samples and nothing. Yes, we found PCV2, we found PCV3 but no PCV4. So that's the first difference perhaps with our report with other reports around the world. So, but you know, we, we went a little farther. So I, I told Molly, you know, there's enough cases or reports out there that describe detection, but no one really linked this to, to make a cost association. There is no lesions described. There is no clinical signs. We put together a summary of I don't know, 50, 60 papers, and the, the clinical descriptions around the go go all over the place, from abortion, lameness, neurological signs. So you imagine, but nothing really connecting causation. So we need to do something else. The PCR and the sequencing, you know, the, the, the whole uh, describing the virus is not gonna it's not gonna help. So it's there, and, and qu people is gonna still questioning, uh, and so what? So we need to do something else. So what she did is she developed an iron scope. So now, with this tool in hand, we are able to see the virus within the lesions. And because, as I said at the beginning, we didn't have an agenda. We didn't look for any specific clinical science. Let's just label every single one and see what we find. So now we have all this slide here with PCV4 lighting up in tissues. And interestingly, we found a a pattern, probably we'll need more, more studies to confirm this, but we found a pattern. The first pattern is that the PCV4 replicating the germinal centers, exactly the same thing that PCV2 does. When you look at PCV3, the, the, the virus normally replicate on those inflammatory cells, the perivascular inflammation that we keep mentioning. So this is a totally different. It looks more like PCV2 than PCV3. That's the first thing. Okay, so now we have this lymphoid lesion which clinically what it means, we don't know, perhaps just a small or slight immune depression that exacerbates other things, that can happen. So what else? Where, where else can we find it? So we start labeling other, other tissues and we found out that the virus replicate on the lamina propria of the intestine when the intestine has inflammation. Example, cases with um, lausonia. So we found PCV4 replicating in the lamina propria. Is the, is the inflammation induced by lausonia the, the, what exacerbates PCV4 replication? Is something that we don't know. I don't. I mean, it, it's really hard to speculate all the way around that PCV4 is going to predispose to this bacterial infection. It's, it's kind of crazy. But certainly the virus is in there. Where there is more inflammation, the virus is, is easily to find. So that's kind of the, the, the story we have here. We still don't know clinically what it means. But certainly there is now, we know that it's not just merely a detection, that the virus caused some sort of inflammatory process and some sort of perhaps depletion. With the uh, initial um, identification of the pathogen, Pablo, uh, I would presume that was maybe a next generation sequencing effort that identified that in kind of a case with generic clinical signs. Is that is that correct? Um, could you talk a little bit basically is... Is this a situation like with PCV3 where we're identifying a virus that when we look at historical samples, it's been there for a long, long time? Or do we have any evidence that it is an emerging pathogen that is, has changed its genotype in some way, shape or form and, and now is being identified because it's truly there more often now? No, I think that is, is the same pattern for PC, the, with PCV3. It's, it's exactly the same part. The virus has been there. It's, it's not something new. It, it, it's not a, a change in 
either of the other PCBs, one, two, or three. It's not a change. It's, I think that the virus has been there for a long time. Uh, even the, the current studies out there show, you know, a specific uh, genetic uh, changes that allow you to classify the virus. At the end of the day, for us as clinicians, it doesn't mean much. It doesn't mean that you, we have a different phenotype. It's, it's, the, it's the same presentation. So at this point, the, 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 the classification, it doesn't really help us to do anything clinically. It's specific for there, and that's all it is. Have you done enough sequencing either with the Thailand samples and or the U.S. samples to understand the genetic diversity within the PCV4s in pigs? Is it highly diverse and there are lots of different populations or pretty conserved? No, it's a really concerned. Uh, in this study, we got Two sequences, two full sequences. Uh, we compare with the ones that are available, which are not a lot. There's not a ton. So ours is close to one that was described in Spain in wild boars. So to make a, to make an idea, it's like a 99, 98.9% similar to the one in Spain. And there is also close similarity with the one in South Korea and Thailand, 97, 98%, somewhere there. But it doesn't indicate that we, we have a totally different virus from the one that is circulating around the world. It's, it's, it's about the same thing. Yeah, that's certainly good to hear. If we do need a vaccine in the future state, you know, that's wonderful that it's a fairly conserved genotype. And maybe we don't need 20 vaccines. If we've got to have a vaccine, one would be broadly protective. Yeah. And and again, you know, the same concept of PCV3 is the real question is, do we really need a vaccine at this point? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Had, uh, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's a question. Uh, the, the question is to really understand the clinical impact. So we know that the, there is this inflammatory background. Is really clinically relevant? If it's not, probably we don't even know about it. We need a vaccine. So if there's a producer out there or a veterinarian out there, Pablo, who's hearing this and saying, ah, my, my pig farm's just not acting right, right? I want to explore, is PCV4 potentially a problem here? Um, is the PCR commercially offered at Iowa State? And how about the RNA scope that you mentioned? Are those tests that we can get done? Yes, they're currently up and running in Iowa State. Uh, we have a PCR. Uh, I don't know yet. It's, it's, I probably need to talk this with the molecular department if the plan is to combine and have a 234 or uh, it's something that I don't know. It, it's, uh, it's in my wishing list. Yes, it is. Uh, but the, the one that I mentioned was um, a research developed. So now it needs to be moved to the streamline and, and things change there. Um, so uh, I know that we have the PCB4, standalone PCB4 is there, but I don't know if it is a plan to, to multiplex. That's that. For the RNA scope, it's up and running, it's validated, so we have it. Uh, um, if you ask me what tissue, perhaps, if, yeah. if you are interested. Uh, what samples should we send you? Yeah, I would think that based on the experience we have, lymph nodes were the more rewarding. Okay. Um, Lymph nodes were, were the ones that we found lower CTs, and we, we were able to see the virus replicating in those tissues. It doesn't mean that you cannot, we, we found it in lung, we found it in feces, so you can use those other sample matrices. Um, I know that tomorrow people are going to run and do oral fluids. We know that. Sure. Um, yeah. and, I, and, and I won't be able to help to do any interpretation on that. Yeah, so yeah. we need to, you know. Safe to say, if you do oral fluids, you'll probably find it. Same thing with <laughs> fluids, right? We expect that it's an endemic pathogen, and don't don't get too excited if you find infected pigs, because that doesn't mean yeah. anything has changed. So that that's what we are. I mean, uh, is is we, we generate quite a bit of information in a really short period of time. I think that they they still need a lot to learn. Uh, so is there? Uh, we need to learn more how to first understand the clinical impact. Secondly, how to do interpretation of the results, the laboratory results. Uh, those things are really important and they, they, they need to be more more research on that area, I guess. Very important work, Pablo, and I can't thank you and your team enough for, for doing the work. Um, circovirus is a sensitive topic for the pig industry, right? We've had, we've had tough experiences with PCV2, and we thank our partners at the diagnostic labs and the, and the pharmaceutical companies for coming up with solutions to that. But we also thank you for continuing to monitor, you know, new evolving diseases like potentially PCV4. Tremendous work, and thank you so much for coming on and sharing that knowledge with our audience. All right. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you, Brandon. 
Well, and to our audience, thank you for being a part of this. Uh, please like and subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. If you found this informational or, or maybe you know somebody that's interested in Circo Virus, send them this episode. Let them hear Pablo's words of wisdom um, to hopefully help them to further explore their situation on their farm. For Dr. Pablo Pinheiro, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thank you so much for joining us and please have a great rest of your day. Hey, everybody. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H E L L O at W I S E N E T I X dot com.